to Tim Marsh from Peter Bell. Date May 13th, 2020. Regarding Bell Copper. Tim, good job. Well done. Congratulations. What a what an epic accomplishment so far. What next? What next? You know, is there what is what is a lifetime in a century mine? You know? What is a discovery window of a century mine? How many how many century mines are there yet to find in Arizona undercover? Right? How many century mines hidden under dirt and rocks? Big wide state of Arizona. How many of these stand to be mined the next hundred years? Right? How are we gonna do that? Is there is there technology? Solutions to this? You know, what does good exploration work look like? Where's the where's the financing? Imagine if the US government put up a hundred million dollars. Could they get a hundred bagger? Value return? Generate ten billion dollars of economic value from a discovery? Spending a hundred million dollars? What? What? Is that possible? Hundred to one return? Maybe. Probably not. Even if it's 10 to 1, you still generate a billion dollars economic value for the, you know, high, high value exercise. It's copper exploration work and mining and refining. Like, lead from the front on a global basis, right? We want to have best standards and the best. you know best production in some sense composite right index of all the factors and things associated with where the coffer is coming from and what all we can do with everything else that comes along from mining it <laughs> what does that look like in the 21st century <sighs> let's find out right Let's find out. <laughs> so much you can do. Please do more passive geophysics. You know, AMT. Beautiful. I want to see passive seismic. You know, you've used, you've used seismic before. And it was exceptionally valuable for showing something that surprised. Some, you know, highly contentious. The angle of displacement, the perseverance ore body, if it exists, potentially not where it should be on a theoretical basis. But the question to that is, how deep is the cover? You know, the sediment, alluvial, rock cover? If it's a kilometer thick, if it's 500 meters thick, if it's 100 meters thick, like... How, big, how, th how deep is the ore body? 500 meters? 600 meters? 1,000 meters? Hopefully, it's more like 100 meters or 200 meters, right? But however deep it is, like, w could we find out with seismic? And then, you know, can we use MT and AMT to get more information, right? So, I'm sure you're already doing it, and it's just a case of drilling some holes. I look forward to seeing what happens next, you know? I really do. Like, good work. All kinds of drilling technology, too. Have you heard about this? Tubing to replace core, t uh, metal core tubing, tubing. Um... What, what am I talking about? So drill drill tubes that are metal 
rods. Um, they can be replaced with some alternative system designed in Australia that's some kind of um, coiled tubing. It's like extensible or something like that and it means that they can roll, roll it out on a spool rather than loading rods one at a time and they don't have rod failure issues so much. Maybe they have other issues, but on balance, uh, it can be done well, right? So we do it. Give it a shot. I don't know if it's available for use yet, but just to suggest that, uh, please. And we'll see again. Uh, I made a recording about it earlier here that underground development a perseverance to get under the cover if you could build some underground work area at the bedrock interface and then start doing shaft work down into underground uh, mine development please afraid it's a rambling message but I uh, hope it's clear Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. To whom it may concern from Peter Bell, date May 13th, 2020, regarding Bell Copper, BCU. Uh, let's recount the history of the project. Don't know when I got cut off in the prior uh, message here, but um, talking about. 2017 January hearing about seismic refraction surveys at Kaba and I'm thinking wow that's crazy and then hearing Tim say it's like going to church I got him to say in a phone call once too it's a really inspiring thing to hear and think about that like <laughs> Uh, so there's a lot to that story it's already three years old for me um, in that time I've written a screenplay I used a speech he gave to like mm, do a very rough attempt at a uh, screenplay it's like the text is his narration of a technical presentation to an Arizona audience and geologists and business people talking about Perseverance Exploration Project. <laughs> what a name! What is gonna be there? How long till they build an underground development, right? For, for underground exploration? Like, they need to get the future, looking forward, three years. I want to see an underground access perseverance, right? So, again, talking about the work that's been done on an exploration basis on these first three years as, as, as documented in my activities and what's possible over the next, you know, six months. Huh. Like, what are they doing right now? I hope they're spending large amounts of money doing some kind of project work. You know, even if that's from remote desktop analysis, do it. The uh, MT and AMT, like passive geophysical techniques that they're talking about using there are primarily data analysis challenges. The technical equipment required to run these surveys is you know, quite discreet, and small, um, sophisticated, but it uh, it sits out for like 15 minutes. Is the concept? Sometimes at night, you put the sensor out at 15 minutes to get a signal. The shape of uh, geological features down through, you know, the different spheres. A sphere 
lithosphere, the mantle, like the core, like what's going on down there? Uh, how is it that passive geophysical signals can provide useful, uh, <laughs> you know, information? It's a data analysis problem. The sensors, you know, you could do an AMT program for twenty million dollars, and like the locals, no one would, would know. If you just deployed massive amounts of surveying, passive surveying equipment, each sample site is in zero impact. This is epsilon, it's a delta. <laughs> it's a differential. Like, uh, the field costs of a massive AMT program, I believe, are much smaller than potentially the data analysis costs, right? So, on a regional scale, and on a local scale, of geophysics and on a project specific scale you know at an ore body underground development and underground drilling if you can get a shaft or a ramp you know tunnel what what is that right what does that give you underground access to do drift and development work and drilling Shout out to Warwick Anderson on Twitter, um, data analyst, geologist from Australia. Uh, impressive person that I want to find a way to like fund in some way, right? Like, how do we back him doing things in Canada? <laughs> Advisory role on exploration programs, please. What would you do? There's so much, right? Just random mention aster imaging and stuff in some of these places with good exposure. And like a classic one is Arizona. There's lots of areas of great exposure in Arizona. But there's also places of deep alluvial like cover, right? Basin and range, erosional deposition that obscures certain elevations you know of, uh, of area as as possible within the drainage conforms of the local rock conditions right some rocks kind of erode and more than others and the Hualafi mountains you know would for whatever reason it's a pretty special spot and something happened and something else happened a bunch more and then some more body ended up under cover an ore body ended up undercover and we found it in the year you know 2150 or or 2050 or 2020 <laughs> right the date frequencies on these discoveries is like a function of like effort and capital and work <laughs> they say uh, drill steel and shoe leather are the price of discoveries. It's true. It's good business. You know, the potential to find billions of dollars of economic value hiding under dirt and rocks and to use the best human ingenuity to build a mine that will operate for over a hundred years. Create so much wealth prosperity and positive impact on the world but you know like we're talking about the area becoming like the largest like does does the USA beat China in the 21 20 2100s in the year 2050 does the USA produce more more copper than China in China the answer is probably yes um, further to that, you know, the Chinese Empire probably produces a lot of copper in, co in Africa that serves its purpose. And it's unclear if on a macroeconomic, you know, historical basis, if having the USA become a powerhouse producer of metals in Arizona and doing value-add work, right? Like what, what kind of stuff is needed in California? Manufacturing facilities. 
and mine this stuff in Arizona. It's better than mining it from the Chinese. Factories in China use Chinese material, you'd think. <sighs> Anyways, it's a huge topic, right? That you can talk about of this global significance of Arizona. Does it matter? Is it is it the future of mining? So I think it could be the future of mining. I think the USA could be great, like in mining. It could. Uh, I think it would probably help. You know, create a lot of wealth. There's like a U.S. debt. It's like 25 trillion dollars. You know, so if you can find a bunch of billion dollar ore bodies in Arizona and put them into production. You can maybe, you know, start to chip away at that debt, right? Imagine if, uh, imagine if the USA started paying its own heavy industry domestically, like a wartime footing, like full on, <laughs> like you can you can increase economic activity a lot that way. Keynesian stimulus is nothing on, you know, industrial control. So, you know, all this financialization and, like, central bank activity can totally become government involvement in private business in the USA. Heavy industry is a good target. As I've said, if you can find a $10 billion ore body by spending $50 million or $100 million, you find $10 billion for $100 million. That's a hundred to one return, is it not? <laughs> like, 100, 100 to one from an economic perspective? Like, can the government do that? <laughs> I don't think so. Maybe, maybe the junior mining business in Vancouver can. <sighs> Probably not. <laughs> um, you know, maybe, maybe HPX can. <laughs> right? <laughs> so, you know, the geostats on, like, how you should drill off a porphyry are hilarious. This is the biggest kind of mathematical optimization constraints and volumetric kinds of calculations, right? It's the statistical inference and interpolation between, you know, intercepts within a you know, three-dimensional shape, right? Where you have a gradient over the spatial dimension that's representing types of metal, right? So a pretty obscure kind of concept that is you know, the mathematical representation of a, of a ore body. And knowing where it is, hypothetically in space, and knowing what your qualification rules are for or estimates and interpolation. You know, your geostats calibrations, if you know what those are and you reverse engineer to those, then, you know, you can optimize your resource uh, inclusion, kind of, with the highest probability, blah, blah, blah. Um, as I say, reverse engineering the resource with this minimum amount of spending as required. Ha, ha, ha. That's a, that's a desktop problem that you could do. Might cost a million dollars to solve. <laughs> you know, how much is it worth? <laughs> Ooh. You know, we're talking about a $10 billion dis economic discovery, right? Uh... I don't know. What? Like, what are your comparables for a discovery like that right now? You know, geographically and like geologically, there's a Santo Tomas project is in Oroco Resource Corp. Resource Corp singular, one one resource. And this is the Santo Tomas. It's like a special vehicle for like a legal play that they worked. It worked very, very well, you know, very well to some asset that was lost to public markets and being abused in some way. And they were able to sue someone to get something. There's a cost basis for that that gives them like a hundred bagger return 
plus, probably, if, if you, you know, consider some of the early seed capital, maybe. Um, there's a lot of value generation in that so far, and a lot more yet to come. Really successful story. Um, and I've always said OCO, BCU. Um, I bring both of these, you know, and I see these. <laughs> the Metals Investor Forum gets a bad rep, but I brought OCO and BCU there, and it's great. Yeah, I talk about my prior recording about taking Tim Marsh to the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium in 2018 in Vancouver. So I did that, and he only met one person, and we did, and that was great. Um, so what turned out is that the reason Tim was in Vancouver at that time was to talk to Robert Friedland, who was also in town for the Sprott Natural Resource Symposium with Rick Rule. Seriously. So uh, I didn't know that at the time. But I found out really busy soon after. And now we're here going on 18 months later. And Robert Friedland's band like, is doing a deal. HBX, Cordoba, all kinds of things. I don't know what the corporate details are, but there's a something afoot. A Kaba, now called Perseverance. And it's a pretty big potential event and talk about all the technology and your return on different technologies and how you drill off something like this if you know it's there if you know if you can image it with geophysics before you even get there confidently oof, how much can you calibrate your drilling seriously and how much will you bother at surface like underground development it's one of the first things I said in my prior recording too, right? Seriously, essential. Underground development. All you need at the Perseverance Project right now is like a shed. <laughs> and a large kind of grain elevator building. And you set up a mechanical drilling machine inside this uh, elevator building to contain with you know with fans to contain the dust generated by this you know insulated machine. Uh, <laughs> so this machine is like digging a hole, right? It's literally digging a hole from surface, and outside of the building you can't tell. And what it does is it goes down, you know, 50 meters or 100 meters and gives you a drill pad. And then you change your tooling, <laughs> you set up a drill at this site, and you operate it remotely from the surface. No one ever has to, no human, like if you do it right with full on robotics, no human has to enter this underground mine complex that emits you know, purified air. <laughs> what? Well, you know, it's the mind of the future. Like, the mind that people around the world will try and come copy because it'll be so revolutionary, right? Like, the most integrated technology and closed system. And, like, safe. And really low footprint, really, and low extraction rate, potentially, to start. Um, pretty unproven tech and you should really just start by finding out what the high grade is and building underground development to get there you know if, if the fully mech uh, robotic system is impossible you can do human mining you know bring you can make development for trucks and stuff too if you really want to get things going <laughs> depending where you ramp, ramp from, right? Where's your access point? Uh, what kind of system are you operating? You know, fully electric, human size, you know, T 
10 foot ceilings and back. Like, rock around is pretty confident. It's all pretty tough, hard rock, and the possibility of just doing underground work. Once, once you know where the system is from geophysics, you build a, you know, if you have to build a 600 meter shaft, <laughs> imagine, imagine a, a shaft that goes down to a drill pad at 600 meters. Um, who does that? What, what would, what would the purpose of that be? Would that be overkill? <laughs> like, is that a good idea? Or is that, like, how much does that cost? Is that $20, $20 million? $50 million? $100 million? $200 million? More? U.S.? Oof, maybe it's, you know, is that what it takes to unlock? Billions of dollars of ore? Right? How efficiently do you drill off? Billions of dollars of ore. Metal. Mineable metal. In Arizona. Under the desert sands. Right? Like, that's what we're talking about here. Remember. There's deep cover to expect. Like there's, there's, <laughs> like this is the, quite a lot of, I, we don't, I have not, I don't have a number on how deep the cover is. I've asked them to do seismic. I said, please do basic geophysical stuff and give us inf more information about this project area because it's, it's very hugely prospective. So help us out here. Like, what are we looking at? I think seismic combined with AMT, passive geophysics, you can do passive seismic. It works out great. So, you think about all that. Most of the time, talking about that kind of stuff is silly, but when Robert Friedland is in the mix, then it's not worth you know, ignoring, might as well mention it. Say it once, say it twice. It's a pretty cool thing to talk about, right? I've heard Robert Friedland say, at this mine, no one will lift anything heavier than a pencil. <laughs> it's a pretty impressive concept. You think about, you know, digital stylus and digital work interfaces, keyboards and <clears throat> app, you know, all kinds of interfaces. All the stuff we can do with glass and glass that we can um, bend, <coughs> you know, <laughs> these bendable, foldable phone uh, phones. They, they have touch features, right? And if you can use that in industrial control offices, Right, so you say, well, then no one's going to lift anything else any heavier than a pencil, and then you give them a, pe a pencil that's a digital stylus, and that's their like stick to interact with the work environment. What does that, what does that look like? Like, are you, into, are you operating robotics at that point? Probably, right? So, mention it again because. It's worth considering. So, what? <clears throat> Robert Friedland. Perseverance. Arizona. USA. So, start this discussion in context of my history with the project. I mentioned 2017 start, 2018, 2019, 2020. I believe that's three years. From January through January, we're past three years now. Anyways, 
Uh, it starts in 2018, not 2017, sorry. 2018, 2019, 2020. We're in the third year of me having some awareness of the story and continue to be in awe of it. In awe of it. It's uh, dismissed and ignored by so many and yet there are a faithful few, right? And you hear what I'm talking about before about how Tim Marsh talking about going to church. Bell Copper as one of the more, you know, cult stock, um, religious sentiment attached to it. Really, you know, seems to be a really dedicated group of people in, in you know, working together here for some reason, you know. I don't know what connection that has to a church, but, you know, there's some people who talk about, you know, kind of religious connection between business and religion, so maybe, after all, not so bad. Um, the wicked, though, because it means cards are on the table. What's possible? Right? totally unknown um, probably not very much you know that's what usually happens in scenarios like this but every once in a while something actually happens and the potential to do underground development at Perseverance is particularly a good idea because we don't know how deep the loose uh, cover is. If we call these alluvial sediments in the basin, and then perseverance is down below in some sort of bedrock, right? Maybe extending down for kilometers. If it extends, if kind of perseverance is an ore body that extends down for five kilometers, basically that would be very impressive, right? If you had to go 300 meters through alluvial cover, most people wouldn't think that it would work. But if the ore starts at the top of the bedrock and you could do underground development through the alluvial sediments and then you know, set up a mining operation, an underground mining operation, at the start of the bedrock interface. What is that? Is that is that a high margin operation? Potentially so, right? So, talk about these three years that have gone by so far, and talk about what the next three years look like. I see a lot of potential I want to you know see <laughs> what uh, happens the option terms allow you know quite a lot of time I believe between stages of payments I believe one of the it's like two years three stages and the last stage like 10 million US so let's talk about underground development, right? What can Friedland do with 10 million for underground development? A perseverance? What does that look like? Is that a reasonable thing to talk about at all? Or is that just silly? Um, answer that, you know, can consider that. Talk about the religious contingent of share of sentiment around Bell Copper, and we'll say <sighs> what? Um, 
also uh, mentioned a screenplay that I wrote. <clears throat> also mentioned a book, you know, collection. Of, I went out with the audio notebook, audio recorder like this, and talked for, I don't know, 90 minutes, and transcribed it and called it a book. Gave it away online for free. Quite uh, focused on online community, actually. Probably pretty useless commentary. Um, but it's about as effective as this entry as a historical, you know, documentary piece. It's a very rough set of notes. Just starting to go past 30 minutes, though. So, mention again, you know, plans for futuristic mining, right? And if Friedland spends 10 million US at Perseverance, what's the most sophisticated thing he could do? build an underground rocket ship like what is that <laughs> like an underground <laughs> operation like clean energy transmission for electric drilling equipment <laughs> it's particularly appropriate as I said because of the cover at Perseverance it's an area of deep cover and we don't know how deep it is. Uh, don't know how deep the ore body is. You know, can you look 10 kilometers down? What's what's going on down there? <sighs> you know, who knows? Uh, I want to see the core, really, at Perseverance, if that's possible. <laughs> Imagine some passive, you know, passive geophysical methods that can do super deep <laughs> imaging. You know, if you could do that on a regional basis, that'd be probably pretty surprising. And, uh, you know, lining up with known mines, 50% uh, taken out of the race, and then look for areas of cities, take those out of the running, and look at all the ones on the 10, 10 kilometer depth scale. You know, look at those areas as undercover. Look at the ones that are undercover and ask yourself how many, you know, how many of those have ever been explored for an economic copper mine, right? Like, I think Arizona is one of the most prolific places in the world for discovery potential undercover. I'm sure there's other places in the world that are like excellent, but I don't know if any have the history of like economic mining, modern mining kind of, that the US does, right? Like if you look around total Arizona mining, like the list of mines, <laughs> right? In the last hundred years, it's probably like first in the nation. Like, more than Nevada, maybe? I don't know. I think so. Arizona's prolific. But... <laughs> Mexico to the south. California to the west. There's all kinds of mining history around here, right? The potential to start a new wave of discovery? Have a new discovery? <laughs> what? This is such a picked-over district. How could there be anything? Well, there is. There's a huge amount of stuff. My other thing, you know, is ask the silver nickel guys. You know, talk about perseverance. Silver nickel. You know, I've told people, like, look at those reports. Who wrote them? It's Tim Marsh. Dr. Tim Marsh. Bell Copper. He wrote reports for Neil Hawkins and John Rothermel from Arizona, and they all, those guys, those two guys have a collection of patented claims at old mine sites. They wait for them to come up in bankruptcy court, and then they head up, uh, visit, do grab a rock hammer, need some explosive, do some testing. <coughs> And then decide if they're going to buy them. 
or not. So they accumulate, you can accumulate all kinds of good assets doing that. It's like a two-man job, and it's hugely productive. But how do you flip the ground, right? That's not so easy. I've told Tim Marsh that I want to see all of those silver nickel properties in Bell Copper. As a shareholder of Bell Copper, I want to see all of those silver nickel properties in Bell Copper. And I want us to give those guys a bunch of stock and some cash, you know? A hundred grand US for them would probably make them happy if they got, you know, two, five percent of the company, 10% of Bell Copper. You know, what's the valuation of Bell right now? Like, it's 10 cents trading. 100 plus million shares out, 10 million valuation. Pretty expensive. <laughs> or is it? I have no idea. Uh, but this, you know. Stock price is a whole other thing, right? Like, what is 10 cents? What is one cent what is five cents like these numbers have implied market gaps associated with them and sometimes it's better not to look at those numbers because in liquid markets people can swell things to unreasonable valuations it's one of the things that people don't seem to understand about uh, junior mining this is a liquid <laughs> Right? Persistent seller. <laughs> There's a persisting seller in the company's shares over entire existence, right? It's called dilution. And, and you know, it's really an opportunity. You know, it's really an opportunity to earn more of the pie. You just have to make contributions. You have to be willing to buy, keep buying, find a way to keep buying, right? So. One of the things I'll say, somewhat controversial here in passing in regards to stock, is that it's best to sell against options as soon as possible. As a as an option recipient, it's best to exercise your options as soon as possible in a junior mining business, and that's because junior mining companies always need money. And if you can pay your own way, you're better off. So getting options and using them on an ongoing basis, flipping your pool, oh, one of my favorite things to do. But, you know, to accomplish that, you have to have some stock action. You know, you have to be able to move the stock. People at the market has to be able to trade in the name. You know, there has to be, you know, you as management have to take advantage of opportunities to set options and then exercise against them put money in the company take the company uh, take money out of mr market's pocket yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's crazy getting yelled at by girls i uh, walk around this way this thing it's crazy so girls agree exercise your options as soon as can be <laughs> see what i'm talking about though like if you can put money in the company, it's better off. For junior miners who never have any money, you gotta do it. You know, you're always thinking about financing. So, so, random passing mention, and we'll say again, talking about finding a mine. Like, just what does that matter? Say again, I wrote a screenplay, and it's possible to do a movie on this. It's like wicked. You do. You do an animation, really. You can do an animated version of the movie. You know, you don't even have to do, and just do a voice, voice actors. <laughs> Imagine, that'd be wicked. Fuck. Give me a break. Is that possible? What, what, what's that look like, like? Ah, man. Yeah, I figured it out. So, how much does it cost to find out? Well, stage three, they talk about spending $10 million US. I'll say it again. It's a lot. That takes them from 70 to 
still don't even have 100%. And I'm sure there's other deal terms that are material. Like, I don't know what they are, right? They have not made the full agreement package public because they never do, because it's the junior mining business in Vancouver. Ugh, and Friedland's a killer. Like, what are you gonna do? How does this have anything to do with it? It's like, what, what kind of games would you expect in a market around something like that out of, out of control? So it's a function of mind of a, mind of a madman, probably more than anything else. The mind of a madman. The mind of a madman. Robert Freeland. Pretty clearly has the resources to make it happen or not. Uh, the political significance of having his Chinese associates discover the Perseverance project in some way. If they were to capitalize development of it, like what does that even look like? You know what I mean? How do you, how do you politically, does the government seize that asset? Does Trump, does Trump, is the last thing that he does? Like how, in 2024 or something? What are we talking about here? Well, yeah, what is, so that is, it's a real question. What does perseverance look like in 2025? 2025. We're in the year 2020. Five years from now, in 2025. What does perseverance look like? Is it a mine? Is it an idea? Is it... You know, a closed site. You know, is it is it uh, mired in litigation and but, uh, you know local dispute? Is it is it legally like you know in good standing as a permittable, buildable, operatable business? Is that is that a concept at play five years from now? How do you get there? Right? Said it before, say it again. I think the number one thing to do is build an underground development. Find out how deep the surface cover is. Build a shaft down through it. Set up some kind of underground operation. It's like green mining methods. Uh, at the mine fate, like the bedrock interface and pray that there's ore to start. You know, do some exploration drilling, you know, maybe before you sink the shaft. But does that, how much drilling do you need to do before you do that? You know, maybe, you know, are we doing reorientable like grid drilling, right? Like, if oil drillers can drill horizontally can we drill laterally off of that to get vertical exploration drills off of horizontal drilling right like think about what they use in fracking they have a vertical they have some, some hole that becomes flat into some bed right so in this case it would be to have a hole that flattens down through the alluvial cover onto the bedrock interface and then from there you drill out laterally um, vertically downwards into the bedrock so drill into the bedrock from a horizontal hole Whoa, is that if you do that you'll be able to test you know in several spots along the horizontal dimension aspect of the hole right so if the hole is a kilometer long uh, that's probably overkill, right? 
but who knows? You know, maybe if you line up far enough away, you know, you really have to have an angle. You have to run a lot of drill core before you get your vertical hole, right? Uh, your, your sorry, your horizontal hole that you can drill vertically off of at depth. Presumably, you know, yeah, I don't know. It's what this is. Uh, but assuming that the bedrock interface is flat at the bottom of the alluvial cover in the basin uh, off the range front, right? So we have the old, we have the Hulapi Mountains as they are today. It's like a religious site, uh, I believe. I don't know uh, if, if that's true. Um, at least to Tim Mars, it's religious. He talks about his church, and he's not wrong. So, um, again, the religious aspect around the stock as well. You have this bell copper stock that's like a pretty culty stock. And then you have these mountains that are historically religious, and you have Tim Marsh talking about going to church on his hands and knees, looking at the fissures like <laughs> from the root system of a giant porphyry, right? And sliced off, slid a few kilometers away, a soft angle, ended up being covered by, you know, maybe 500 meters of alluvial sedimentation. And we're talking about. Finding it, drilling it, mining it, what it's worth to the American econo economic system, right? Like, what's, what's the value of that? Can we make a $10 billion discovery? Can we make a $10 billion discovery? If you spend $100 million and you discover something worth $10 billion, you're getting a 100 to 1 return. Can the government do that? Can the government do that? You know, can Robert Friedland do that? <laughs> can Robert Friedland do that in partnership with the Chinese government? Right? Is the Chinese government funding mineral exploration in, in the USA, in Arizona, under, you know, joint venture agreements with public companies out of Canada? So what does discovery look like there? What does mining look like there? You know, what is the future of Arizona, right? Is it a place of huge economic value and prosperity and productivity? Of course. I hope so. Like, yes. <laughs> right? I think the world can get involved in mining there. We have some of the best mines in the world. Totally. Like, seriously. I, I do believe that. I, I don't know, you know, if... If that matters, right? So we're talking about bell copper stock, and so in three years since I started following them, I have all these things I've noticed. Pretty cool. And there's more, of course, right? Um, but you know, what does it all matter for the stock? And you know, you have to think about a culty stock as being unusual, right? Unusual. Totally unusual. It's gotta be, right? Like, defining feature of those things is like, they don't look like other stocks in the market. So, do it. You can do it. It's just a case of spending money, you know, capitalization to do these massive spending programs. High risk, high risk endeavor, safety risks. Like, oh, let me say, it's it's an unusual situation, and you know, for me to be named Peter Bell, I look at that and I think, yes, please. Right? Yes. Yes. Bell Copper Company. Ah, what a name. Whew. Gives me chills. Gives me chills. I hope it still exists long into the future. You know, if it has to be Bell Copper Royalty, if it has to be Bell Copper Exploration, 
<laughs> you know, if the Bell Copper Company gets sold and we have to start Bell Copper Exploration. Uh, Bell Gold? Bell Nickel? What? Don't do that, right? You can't be so thematic. Why not? Like, what are the other company names? <laughs> where's Anderson Copper? Seriously, if Anderson is a name like Bell, where? <laughs> or Anderson is more on the nose of a name, I guess, hey? And so it's not the same. Bell is both an object and a name. Hmm. Yeah, Bell Gold, I'll say it again. Bell Copper Exploration as a spin out, I'll say it. Bell Copper Royalties, I'll say it. Bell Copper Royalty, singular, I'll say that separately from royalties plural. You know, because if you're going to spin out one royalty, I want it to be the Perseverance Royalty. Ideally, it's the 20% interest on Perseverance. You know, if we have to make matching contributions to Robert Friedland finding one of the best copper deposits of the history of the world in Arizona, undercover, like you, like Mongolia. <laughs> Maybe, you know, is it, is that, does it make sense? Is it a possibility? Is it a probability? Is it a payoff? What, what are we talking about here? So, the stock becomes more than the stock, right? That's the thing with, again, these culty situations and these, we talk about religion, we talk about, <laughs> uh, talking about, um, like, Faith, you know that's a word that I didn't say yet, but it's an important one, faith. And the reason the word faith is important is because it's like credit, credere, credere, Latin, credere, credit, stands for like trust. And we talk about the credit system in financial markets. So that's built on credit, credere, and faith. It's built on faith between people taught, you know, to, to, to do business. It's a credit, <laughs> you know, legal, the credit and responsibility built by a, a legal system for corporate law, where you create persons who are not natural persons and they do things with other persons to create commerce and affect economic activity, right? This is the basics of what we're doing here. And when it's reflected in the stock market, that's that's interesting, right? So I said before this 20% interest of Bell Copper. I'm talking also about you know futuristic mining scenarios and all kinds of science fiction. Um, but there's some facts that we have. Um, we don't really have all the facts because the full joint venture agreement is not public, so it's unclear what this 20% um, interest that Bell Copper attains requires. Um, presumably it's one-to-one -one matching on all project expenditures. Um, I don't know what is defined as project expenditures, right? Is it just things that happen physically on site at Perseverance, or is it things that happen off-site, you know, in some prep or off-site some management capacity or data analysis, like what's the data share or cost sharing agreement, you know, who gets to set the budget? If we're paying 20% of the budget, who gets to say what the budget is, right? If they, if they, that's, so I've talked before about how like Bell Copper faces a challenge in the length of time between the stages of the payments that Friedland has to make and the clock on them. You know, who says when the two years starts each time and how far into each one are we, right? And how much time do we have left? Potentially, he has a lot of time left. And that's bad for Bell Copper because it means dilution to survive without anything else going on. So there's a possibility of splitting the company and having a uh, royalty company that keeps this 20% interest that Friedland's earning into, 
and then have another company that's much more consolidated in shares, you know, like six to one or 10 to one, and do that as an exploration company and come out with that with like a $5 million valuation by putting in all of the silver nickel properties. What are they? Oh, it's a bunch of patented claims. There's mines in Arizona. Oh, how many are there? Well, depending how you count them, there's 50 mines on this, you know, collection of 30 properties. What? What are you talking about? Well, some guy spent 30 years hunting through the local bankruptcy courts, finding patented claims that came up for sale. And they bought them and put them in this, in this private company and just held on to them. And we got them for Bell Copper Exploration, and we're going to work through them. We're going to bring Tim Marsh's knowledge. He's already written reports on these projects. We're good. This is a huge opportunity for Bell Copper Exploration to move forward. Bell Copper Royalty Corp. It's going to sit there, you know? Pretty soon, the Royalty Corp is going to have to look at paying matching contributions, right? Is it going to make 20% matching or is it just going to get diluted down to whatever kind of royalty position it has? You know, how much, how much spending does it take? 20 million, 50 million total spending by Friedland's group to dilute Bell Copper down to just a 2% royalty if it is that, say? Why a 2% royalty? You know, so many questions, but like, <sighs> that deal on Perseverance with Cordoba it would be totally presumptuous to and jump the gun and spin that out into a royalty company at this stage because Cordoba hasn't earned into the project. So all you have is an option deal. What are you going to do with that? Just seed a pubco. That's a terrible idea. So, and consider this. Not only that, this royalty company isn't a royalty yet. It's a 20% JV participating interest it's a participating interest your royalty company is, requires capitalization to match Friedland spending on their perseverance projects or it gets diluted down to a royalty that's your royalty company spin out idea are you crazy what if they drop the option blah 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 so much to say, but simple idea is killer, right? To get to a point where you can spin out that royalty interest and then go and get a bunch of exploration ground and put Tim to work on it. Like, will you be able to capitalize Tim Marsh's exploration expertise on the other side of a discovery, a perseverance? Maybe, maybe not. You know, it depends how markets are. Um, hopefully, you'd be able to. Um, it would be nice to have a tighter vehicle when you do that, right? So the reason to do a spin co is to get a, a rollback, right? 10 to 1, even if you can. So, you know, to get it back under 10 million shares for a new exploration company, it's publicly listed. Like, ugh, this is not a situation where they can afford the back-end office to make that happen, necessarily. You know, it's kind of wasteful spending, generally. Um, but... You know, as I round out looking at like an hour long recording here, I'll say again, like consider the exceptional, right? Like consider the possibility that this is like unusually good. And if it was, what would you do? Right? Hypothetically, if you were, you know, like are, are you on the other side of one of the most legendary like junior mining players? Are you on the same side of the table as him? Are you on the opposite side of the table? Is he even at this table? Like, what are you, what table are you at? Like, what do you think you're doing, you know? And so the thing, like, for me is, like, Bell Copper, when I found, when I met it, was in a uh, deal with Rio Tindo. Um, I want to say the Homestake Mining Company, but I'm not sure. Uh, sorry, guys. Really never got a chance to meet anybody from there or have much to do with them or think about them at all. Um, but I gather it was a pretty, you know, good idea for them to partner up. And it's just a case of, you know, what got done in the field, right? 
it sounds like, you know, to hear Tim Marsh talk about a hole they never drilled, and then for him to drill that one with Friedland's money and to say, yeah, you know, you got to say, well, what's that worth? <laughs> you know, what's what's a Tim? What's a yes from Tim Marsh? Keep going. What does that mean? This is the guy whose first hole was so surprising that his second hole was how many kilometers away? Like, what happened? You know, he did. It's just you look that far back. And you think about the Hail Mary pass, right? And you think about the Hail Mary religious thing again, right? So, pick some lavender and go, man. That's what it is. Beautiful stuff. And it's beautiful down there and In Arizona too. So, you know, I'm here talking about like the potential to change the world, but you don't need that, really, to have, you know, the stock go up, right? And talking about an exploration spin co and a royalty spin co, you don't need that either. That's, that's kind of goofy to even mention it, right? But, you know, we're talking about a situation where Robert Friedland's earning 80% of a project as I understand it. You know, maybe that's an unfair characterization to make publicly. Um, but that's my understanding. And in my recording I made before, I was talking about how uh, the history of my relationship with Tim Marsh and how in the summer of 2018 he came to Vancouver. And I met with him uh, briefly at the Hotel Vancouver. I met him and we walked over there. And... We met one person in the lobby. I've told this story already. And we didn't meet anybody in the conference. We didn't make a roof rule or anybody like that, um, even though it's kind of his event. And it's because uh, Tim was out having some other meetings, and, I, and Friedland was in town in Vancouver at the same time. So I presume that they met at that time because the deal was signed soon after, maybe six months Maybe 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 less, maybe three months, maybe six weeks. I can't say, um, but it's pretty bullish all around. And here are so many more stories about the whole thing. But you know, think about Tim in Vancouver. I think about Tim at the drill site playing his guitar, right? So, drill steel and shoe leather, right? Drill steel and, sh and shoe leather, that's how discoveries are made. So, to be able to get that, see all that, wonder who all else is involved, right? It's a cast of characters beyond anything I can understand or conceive of at this point, right? There's so many people taking an interest in it. Um, the potential data analysis and stuff like that and productive work could be done. It's just, again, getting hard to understand. Uh, hard to... So, what do you do? Uh, hold on tight. Do what you can to, you know, support the junior, right? That's the whole thing. It's like activist investor stuff, right? That's what the junior mining business, I think, is based on activist investors right so where wherever you can do that i don't know if you can in this situation bell coffer but i think so you know there must be a way what is it what is it well for most people it's going to be buy shares you know, if they actually feel compelled, right? If this religious fever strikes a group of people and there's like a shared feeling of excitement, 
around doing something together. That something can be as simple as buying stock in a company, right? So we talk about bell copper stock being like a very illiquid market and the potential to do things in it where you, you know, cause games that result in all kinds of weird things happening. Stock trading, heavy, heavy volumes. Anonymous, anonymous filings. <laughs> like, how many, how many groups are there using proprietary trading firms to you know disguise uh, proprietary trading firms in Canada to disguise offshore money is that is that happening at all like on a net flow basis like probably not unless the prop company is a fraud right is how many fraud prop proprietary trading companies are there in Canada probably a few I have no idea um, it's a pretty you know is it a good business at all like prop trading in Canadian stocks uh, prop trading in US stocks is a popular thing to do but I don't know about Canadian ones to be honest and then you think about Friedland and you think about the stock and you think about religiousness and religiosity and the potential for, you know, a group of people to all want to do the same thing and be united in some activity. And who do they want to be united around, right? It's like a total Friedland character, if possible. So it's 65 minutes here and go for just 66 and say, you know, totally epic opportunity, right? What does it look like? I don't know. What next? I don't know. You know, what's driving this thing? I don't know. Uh, are we going to have any success ever? I don't know. Uh, the reality of this business is that, you know, huge upside is there. If you know what you're doing. It's not hard to do good business in the junior mining business. Um... You know, theoretically, <laughs> in reality, it's a killer business. The dedication that Tim Marsh has put into this, unheard of, unheard of. You know, like Arizona has been a pretty tough spot for a lot of Canadian juniors. Um, you know, really low cap, low financing, right? Like it's not a lot of Vancouver money for Arizona, you know? There's some, there's some, there's some all money around the world for Arizona, but man, it's tough financing these junior mining companies. So, going to figure it out, right? To whom it may concern from Peter Bell date May 13th 2020 Wednesday May 20 May 13th 2020 regarding Bell Copper BCU So I've been following this story since maybe January 2018 first uh, first time talking to somebody from the company Dwayne Deal called me uh, and I said that I did an interview with Tim Marsh for free and he said okay here's Tim's number let me call him and I'll let you know if he's up for one <laughs> something like that Maybe the other world around. But I had a call with Tim, CEO, and I did not record. 
Uh, yeah. Wrote about it, but did not record it. And have had many subsequent recorded calls since. Um, the next thing that I did with him, uh, Tim, after the first call, was a recording of his room we uh, had in Vancouver, downtown, in, J- in uh, January 2018 at the Cambridge House Investment Conference and the Association of Mineral Exploration of British Columbia both had their annual meetings at the same time. It's a great idea. It's like better than PDAC. Vancouver in January is better than Toronto in March. And Vancouver in July is better than all of them. So the Association of Mineral Exploration should do an event concurrent with uh, Rick Rule's uh, Sprott Natural Resource Symposium. Assuming that's still going on with Sprott Media. Uh, it was 18 months after I first met Tim that I took him to the Rick Rule show in Vancouver in July. He was in town for other meetings. 